I just took one look at him, and he said, Marty, John John has been killed, and I, I don't think I even heard him. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss a single episode. Marty Peterson was one of the first women CIA operatives to be assigned to Moscow, probably the most challenging posting during the Cold War. Her story begins in Laos during the Vietnam War where she accompanied her husband John, a CIA officer. She describes their life in a small city in Laos and the devastating news she received on October the 19th, 1972. Marty returned to the United States and one night at dinner, a good friend suggested she look into working for the CIA. After making it clear to CIA recruiters she didn't want to be a secretary or an admin assistant, they trained her to become an operative, effectively a spy. When Marty was posted to Moscow, during the day she worked as a diplomat in the US Embassy. At night, on weekends and during her lunch breaks, she would report to the CIA station in the same building to do her work as an operative. Now, Cold War history is disappearing. However, a simple monthly donation will help keep this podcast on the air. You'll get the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you, and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve Cold War history. Hello, I'm Nick Packham from Worthing in the UK. I support the Cold War Conversations podcast financially, as it's important that these stories and experiences from the Cold War are preserved before they're lost. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us, as well as sharing us on social media. It really helps us get new guests on the show. I'm delighted to welcome Marty Peterson to our Cold War conversation. I went to a small liberal arts university in New Jersey. And I studied sociology there, certainly not political science or anything that was any way connected to what I eventually did. What sort of career were you thinking of at this point? When you're in college, you're very young, of course, and you don't have any, certainly not technical in any way. I, I thought maybe I would become a social worker in schools or eventually I would teach in school. Um, And that's what I did. I went on to get my master's degree from the University of North Carolina, and I uh, taught in college, junior colleges. And it's in college that you meet your husband, John, isn't it? Right. I meet John the first week of college, and there certainly was electricity there. Uh, But he and I dated other people and just became wonderful friends. It wasn't until our last two years that we uh, that I uh, started dating and we dated exclusively. He he was a physics major, so he was a, a very very smart, and um, I thought he would go on in education, you know, to get more degrees in physics. But he decided he wanted to be a journalist, and he was accepted at several good journalism schools in the U.S. at when we graduated, but. After that, um, he realized that he really couldn't be a journalist without authentic experience. The Vietnam War was raging and the draft was active, so he decided he would go into the military. And uh, that's what he did. And I went on to work various jobs and moved around some. Is John drafted into the Vietnam War? No, he enlisted in the Army for two years. And during that period, did you have any idea what he was doing? Yes, I knew he was, uh, he went to jump school and I knew that he had joined the Green Berets and I knew that was where the action was in Vietnam if you weren't just a slug in a regular uh, military group. So I knew he had selected an elite group to work with. How do you handle knowing that he's in danger 
almost every day. How how do you carry on normal life? You, you don't really know how you handle it, really, Ian. You just um, you just live life every day. And I watch the news every night. And Walter Cronkite told me where the fighting was, and it never seemed to be where John was. Um, about five years ago, though, I read a book about what John did. And if I'd known what I know now and what I learned in that book, I certainly would have been horrified. But he came home alive, um, like many others didn't. 55,000 didn't. Indeed, indeed. And when he returns, I understand he decides to join the CIA. When when did he tell you about this uh, new career move? <laughs> Well, he uh, when he came back, he didn't say anything about CIA. Um, we weren't married, of course, at that moment when he came back. We shortly then got married in 1969. And um, it was only after we got married that he was allowed to tell me that he had applied to the CIA. <laughs> so I, I took it on. It was what he wanted to do, and I was always game. He knew that. Were you vetted at all by the CIA when you got married, just to uh, check out your background? Uh, no. Um, when you marry someone, I had to fill out a form that said who I was, who my family was, where I'd lived, and all of that. And certainly that was, you know, a, a, just a standard vetting, I think. Uh, nothing, nothing no, in, no security investigation or anything. So... John gets posted to Laos, and you're going with him? Yes. Um, that's always a curious point. People always wonder, why Why would you go to such a place with him? Well, the CIA liked couples to go. Um, it it was not an, a very dangerous place, Paxé, Laos. It had been shelled. Uh, mortar rounds had come in. Um, but they'd ship the children out and the wives all stayed behind. So the wives went because we were very useful as low-wage secretaries and file clerks and pouch clerks. Um, I, I certainly was enlisted in that group. It kept us from joining up in the afternoon, all the wives together and drinking daiquiris, frozen daiquiris. What was the CIA up to in Laos at this point? What was its connection to the Vietnam War? Uh, John's job there was to hire or enlist Lao irregular troops. He trained them and he outfitted them. And then he um, had a plan, the CIA had plans, and inserted these Lao troops along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Ho Chi Minh Trail went through where we were, 12 kilometers from our town. And so the troops, the Lao troops were there to interdict the flow of the North Vietnamese army, both manpower and materiel, to South Vietnam. So that was their supply chain down through Laos to South Vietnam. And John's troops interdicted those, those North Vietnamese troops. And before you went to Laos, did the CIA give you any training or let you know what to expect or anything like that? <laughs> no, you know, we when we, it, we were, well, I, John gave me a very interesting book about Laos, but it was, of course, historical. It was about the culture, um, certainly not about what our job was there. Um, when we got there, we learned, well, I walked into a house that had a bunker in it. Um, so I learned very quickly that we were pretty much on uh, in a hot zone, um, and certainly we we had an evacuation route. Um, I never really took it seriously, um, but we never had to evacuate over land. We were evacuated. The women were evacuated once because it got too dangerous, but um, for the most part, daily life was daily life. You mentioned the bunker in your house. What was your accommodation like? Well, we called it a French colonial house. It, the only similarity was white painted stucco. Um, it didn't have central air conditioning, and it had two window air conditioners, one on the first floor and one in our bedroom. But 
it was a, a comfortable house with rattan furniture and um, an inside kitchen with a stove and, you know, so I fixed dinner. Uh, I went to work. I I read a lot of books. I sewed some of my own clothes. I went over to girlfriends' houses. Uh, we would meet up. Um, life was kind of very normal, but we had no TV. We had no radio. We had no newspapers. We had mail every week or two. Um, so life was a very uh, limited that way. I can only imagine what it would have been like with a computer and and the Internet. But it simply was a very basic uh, existence there. Marty, can you take me through October the 19th, 1972? John had told me uh, the night before or the day before that um, his troops were going to go into a, um, a more hostile area there along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And it was going to be an, a big infill. There was another officer, um, Leon, who also was putting his troops in at the same time. And when I say putting the troops in, they carried him in by helicopter. They put him on the ground. The choppers got out of there. So um, I knew that it was a big offensive operation to really flood that area. So I went to work that morning after John left. He he got up at 4 a.m. He picked up his knapsack, his, his uh, M6. Well, he carried an AK-47 with a folding stock. Um, he kissed me goodbye. Like I said, it was 4 a.m. I knew I would see him again that night, and um, off he went. Um, I went into work like I always did and um, worked the full day and got home at 4 o'clock and uh, set to fix dinner. I was sitting down and reading, and I expected him home about 5 or 6. Now, this is October, so now it's dark at this hour, um, and I heard his truck drive in on our our driveway which was all gravel and it was a good uh, alarm i could hear cars and trucks driving on it and i thought that uh, john's home so i got up and went to the door to meet him but it wasn't him it was our chief here there and um i just took one look at him and he opened the door and came through the door and he said, Marty, John, John has been killed. And I, I don't think I even heard him. I, I walked over and I leaned against the wall and I, you don't even process information like that. It's such a shock. Um, before I knew it, my house was filled with friends who came to, to share the news and share their sadness. Um, and, you know, my life ended along with John's. I mean, it was beyond understanding um, how that felt. Um, and the next day, wives of John's Lao commanders, the Lao troops who were commanders, and their wives came over. And we all sat in a circle, and we could not communicate with words, but they they were there for me because they knew how much my husband meant to them. His name, his Lao name was Tamak, and uh, they all mourned the loss. Um, you know, in, in that war, Americans simply didn't die. I think that the Lao thought that maybe Americans had a special spell or protection because Americans just weren't killed in Laos. Um, so CIA sent me home, and and that was the beginning of nothing for me. I, I simply didn't know where I was going. Marty, I really appreciate you sharing that with me. Um, it's difficult to comprehend how someone deals with with that news and, and, and how you just process it in those following days, weeks and, and months. You know, I see these women on TV about, you know, having lost husbands because of 9-11 and all. And, you know, they I, I know exactly what they're feeling. It's just you go into nothing. You have no 
no ability to even think about it. It's too horrible. 27 years old. Marty, well, when you're back in the, the US, you start to think about uh, joining the CIA and following in John's footsteps. Can you explain how that uh, process came about? After I'd spent a few weeks with my parents in Florida, I had to go to Washington to sign some insurance papers. And while I was up there, I stayed with a couple who had been with us in Paxe. And uh, the the husband said to me, Marty, what are you going to do? And I said, I, I, Tom, I have no idea. And he said, well, have you considered joining the CIA and doing maybe what John was going to be doing? And I, I said, that sounds as good as any. Um, I mean, it really was rudderless at this point, and that sounded like a, a reasonable thing to do. I spoke several languages. I had lived overseas. I had lived as a CIA wife. Um, so I thought, well, I'll give that a shot. So um, I told this man who was processing all my papers what I wanted to do, and he arranged for me to have an interview. So I went to this interview, and the man was very nice, and he asked me all these questions, and I told him what I had been doing, and he, he said, well, that's wonderful. I think we certainly can find a position for you as a secretary. And I said, well, I don't think so. I, I don't think that's really what I wanted to do. I shook his hand, and I left, and I went back to this fellow that was processing the paperwork, and I said, wrong guy. I'm not working as a secretary. I'm not even good at it. He laughed. <laughs> So he then arranged for me to have a, a serious interview with the people who were hiring new operations officers. How rare was it for the CIA to have female operations officers at this point? Well, we were few and far between. And the training class that I entered with was, uh, there were 40 of us, and there were I'm going to say, very, very, very few of us who were women. Uh, at that point, we were right at the cusp of women kind of getting more involved and being taken more seriously, and that's what they had to do. So they trained us just along with the men. It was equal treatment. What was that first day like arriving at the CIA headquarters? It was obviously an important day for you nervous but it was also a a poignant day because of the date yes when i when i walked in that building i had been there before i think um in in such a different way i had been there as a widow and i walked in the front welcoming center um of cia it's very impressive general donovan has a big statue and there's a wall of stars of officers who've been killed in the line of duty. And uh, I walked in there and thought, you know, this is a huge step for me. And and again, I thought, where is John? You know, where, why isn't this his life? You know, um, it it was overwhelming, I must say. And it was John's birthday as well, wasn't it? July 3rd, yes. Um, yeah, it was a momentous day. Um, not, not, certainly not like any of the others who I was joining in that group. And, you know, funny, I, I didn't really tell them all the details uh, of my husband's death and all. Uh, I wanted to be me, and I wanted to be worth, you know, the same as everyone else. Um, I always worried about being the widow that they had to hire, but I felt I qualified for for being an equal, and they treated me that way. Can you tell me anything about the uh, initial training that you had with the CIA? We were training as operations officers, um, and the the first part of our training was the history of the intelligence community and various psychological things and 
and we were all focused towards learning how to recruit agents to work for CIA. Agents who were foreign um, citizens who worked in their government, in the, in a foreign government or a foreign army, and how to recruit those people. You had to learn a lot about their psychology and how to use that to convince them to basically become traitors. That's not an easy thing to convince a person to do. So that was the basis of our training. We didn't do any parachute training. I never did any arms uh, training. We didn't even do an arrest scenario. We were strictly there to learn how to recruit and then run agents overseas. We were learning how to make personal meets, but in secret, um, out, out, of, out, out of sight from the normal human beings in the world. Uh, so in safe houses or moving cars, that kind of thing. We didn't do dead drops in that particular training. It was later on when I got my first assignment that I learned how to do the dead drops in the caches and signals, chalk signals and that kind of thing. And when you reach the end of this training, you're, you're offered some opportunities which you, how can I say it, you, you don't find them particularly favourable. There were some jobs that I was offered after this that I learned, and I did research on these, and I used uh, my own little intel network to find out that these were mostly women's jobs, jobs in the in the CIA offices overseas that were, you know, support jobs. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be out on the street. I wanted to be part of the action. So I turned down jobs, which was crazy. I had no, uh, no, you know, what, who was I? I was a, you know, a brand new hire and I was turning down jobs overseas. However, you do get a offer of a post which uh is uh more what you're looking for let's say so i was called by this man who wanted to interview me bob fulton and bob said um meet me in this office and so i did and he told me that he was the new um chief going out to our office in moscow well well now we're getting somewhere and uh He's, I said, he said, I think you'd be a, a perfect member of our team. And he said, you know, if they arrest you and they hit you, they beat you up, they pull you out of a car, it's going to hurt you the same as it would hurt me if they pulled me out of a car. He said, I don't see any difference. And I think that you might, might do very well in Moscow with us. Well, I, <laughs> I was blown away. and. You know, I think from childhood, I was always willing to take a challenge. And this was, I guess, the biggest one I'd ever taken. And to give some context here, Moscow during the Cold War was the most hostile environment for the CIA to operate in. Yes. And we we didn't have um, a long track record at this point. Um, we had had a few agents, but we'd had Penkovsky, and, you know, that ended very badly. Um, and then the the agents we tried to run before that, it hadn't worked very well. But we were working kind of with new management and a new way of operating that I think worked much better um, and certainly offered us uh, great opportunities to collect significant intelligence. Indeed, which we will come on to uh, shortly. But did you know any Russian at this point? No, I learned uh, in college or high school, I learned uh, Spanish and French and German, but I had no Russian. But Russian was taught at the time in some universities, just not mine. So I had to undergo 44 weeks of Russian language. That's a very long time. That's almost a year. You know, it's two months. It's it's forever because I was studying from eight in the morning to five in the afternoon in a classroom, and then we would go on um, 
weekends, some weekends where we would only speak Russian. Um, and that's what I did for those 10 months learning Russian. Were these native Russian speakers who were teaching you? Yes, they. it was interesting. They were native Russian speakers from St. Petersburg. That means they were born in before 1911. They were born in St. Petersburg, not in Leningrad. It was very amusing. Some of their language um, was somewhat antiquated, I think, because they had emigrated long before. But the language is the same. And of course, the grammar and the pronunciation, all of that is the same. And so they gave me a wonderful basis uh, to be able to speak. You mentioned before that once you knew your assignment, you had further training. Can you tell me how long that was and, if possible, what that training consisted of? Right. So after I finished language in May, um, then I joined uh, the group that was going out that summer. Um, that was basically the new team going to Moscow. And we did training on the street which was to to be able to spot and then manipulate surveillance teams who were following us. At first, we had teams who were um, just contract teams who learned how to do surveillance. But eventually, in our final, uh, we had um, an FBI team that, ha that followed us. So it was very challenging. We had to actually do operational acts while we were under surveillance. So we had to use and to learn all those new techniques. We had to learn how to take pictures with these little miniature cameras that we palmed in our hands to take pictures of where we would put a dead drop, uh, a cache, or where we would put down a car toss package, where you talk uh, a package out of the car window. And in my case, of course, I was single. I wasn't married, and I had to do all the operational acts myself. Plus, I had to um, to be able to spot surveillance without a wife or a mate sitting beside me to help me spot surveillance. So it was it was exceedingly challenging, and and yet it it was very effective. So you're on the street looking for surveillance but you can't look as though you're looking for surveillance so that must be especially challenging to um to do that how how, how do you manage to uh avoid looking like you're expecting surveillance that's right and uh, there are a lot of tricks to spotting surveillance you just can't be caught doing them it's like if you're walking along a street in a city, you have a, a department store and there are big glass windows. Well, you can look and see who's following you in that glass window, but you certainly don't want to be caught looking. Um, also, when you're turning and heading in a different direction, often surveillance won't turn with you. They'll go on and then another car will follow you. Um there were a lot of techniques we had to learn, and you had to become so aware of what was normal on the street. What would be a normal way someone would act? And eventually surveillance give themselves away because they're trying to watch you. They have to intrude in your peripheral vision somehow. If they can't see you, you can't see them kind of thing. Um, so this was a, a great challenge. And you're right. You have to learn to act very normal on street. And and that was often a critique we had was, you know, Marty, you, you made that drop and then you sped up. And that's because your adrenaline kicks in and your heartbeat races. And, you know, you've done it. You've gotten away with it. And then you start walking faster. Well, that's a real giveaway. If someone is watching you, what did she just do? Incredible sorts of uh, little details that just give you away in those circumstances. Absolutely. What was your arrival in Moscow like? What What is it like going through passport control in Moscow, <laughs> knowing that you're a 
CIA officer. Yeah. Um, you know, when the plane landed in Moscow, in Moscow, um, there was this stuff plowed in the side of the runway. And I, I looked at it. I had come from Florida, so I thought it was sand. But when I got off, I realized it was, it was snow. And they had had quite a snow before I had arrived in early November. I came down. They didn't have jetways, of course. They had roll-up steps. So as I came down the stairs, I thought, I bet there's someone with binoculars looking. And I'm sure I have CIA stenciled across my forehead. I, You are absolutely instantly paranoid. And you are sure that they must know who you are. Um, and so I walked into the the passport control, and you hand over your passport, and with as blank a face as you can possibly make, you answer the questions, you watch the man's face. Um, they're, they're very good at what they do. They, they don't express anything, but they do pause when they're looking at your passport just to make you squirm a little if you're going to. But why would you squirm if you're a normal human being? You know, you're just going through passports. So that's what I did. Um, and, you know, I um, I don't think they ever thought that I was any different than any other woman that was assigned to the embassy. Yeah, I guess you have to put on a Oscar-winning performance every time to uh, carry it off. Right. But it can't really be a performance. You really have to live it. That's the difference. Because if you perform, they're going to catch you when you're not. If it's who you really are, and I've always been called Party Marty because I always laugh and I always have a smile. And, you know, you have to be the person you are. You just have to incorporate that shadow person. So you have to live that person, take on their skin and body and, and personality in its entirety. You have to take who you are and become that plus the other thing. Really fascinating insight, Marty. Thank, thanks for that. Where are you put up initially in Moscow when you arrive on that day? So the... Um, the man who met me, the embassy officer who met me, um, he and the driver took me to the Peking Hotel. And um, he carried my suitcase up the steps into the hotel, set down my suitcase and said, well, um, the embassy's down and around the corner and we'll see you tomorrow. And I realized after he left that I had no money with me. I had no rubles. You can't import rubles at the time. You couldn't. and. Um, yeah, I was really, I was just abandoned at that point, I felt. Um, and being a little paranoid, you're standing in Moscow, you're a CIA officer there. Um, it was, a, it was, it, it was a moment, I must say. Um, they took me up to my hotel room. It was one of those cage elevators with a man on the elevator pulling the cage closed and turning the thing and up we went. And got out of the elevator, and there is a woman um, who is the hall dragon. That's what we called her. And she had all the keys, and you got your key from her, and if you went out, she took the key back from you. So she always knew where you were, or if you were in the room. And then down to the room. Um, the room was very nice. It was clean. Um, had a big bathtub and, you know, two twin beds, a phone. I think it had a TV, but who knows if it worked. And uh, so there I was. And I really didn't feel competent or ready to go down and see what they had for dinner in the restaurant. I had been told that restaurant food in hotels was limited. So um, I opened my suitcase to unpack a few things, and I found that my mother had packed a bag of apples in my suitcase because she knew how much I loved apples and it was her little gift for me to discover. And I'd also stolen cheese and crackers off the Lufthansa. You know, my lunch tray had cheese and crackers I didn't eat. So that's what I had for dinner that night, the apples and the cheese and crackers. And I sat there just amazed at the fact that I was actually there. The 
rubber had met the road and it was reality. All those yeah. months of studying Russian and all that training, and here I was all by myself. That was the real deal. Wow. Wow. I, uh, there's no way I could be doing that job. That's just, uh, <laughs> Incredible, incredible. Um, the the next day, how do you get to the embassy? Do you just uh, walk there? Well, you have to understand, as an intelligence officer, I had pretty much learned the map very, 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 very well. The city map of Moscow, which, by the way, was designed and created by CIA analysts. Um the Soviets didn't really have maps. They didn't like maps. They didn't do maps. They didn't want people to know too much. So I had a perfectly good CIA map, and I knew where the embassy was. So I went out, and it was cold. Oh, it was cold. I'm going to say it was 20, maybe 15 degrees as I walked around the corner and down the the garden ring to the embassy. Um it was a, a considerable walk, and it was very cold. And one of the old grandmothers, Soviet Babas, she came up to me and scolded me because I didn't have a hat on. I wish I'd had my hat on. It was cold. Yeah. So I guess you'd you'd come prepared for that cold. You you know you had a a heavy coat and uh, what have you. Yes, I had. You know, there was no polar tech at the time. It was a camel coat with a pile lining and and a belt on it, which I was it was full length. It was a great coat and um it it was so suited me well, but uh I did have a down parka uh, as well. Um but I just wore my coat that day and went down to the embassy. Of course I had to stop the Soviet guards stopped me at the entrance to the embassy and asked who I was, and I told them that I was a diplomat um, first day coming to the embassy, and I showed them my black passport, and they allowed me to go in to the embassy. You know, the embassy in Moscow, the old building, the, the main entrance to the offices was on the ninth floor. So you had to take an elevator all the way to the ninth floor and get off. And that's where the Marine Guard was stationed. And so that's where I got off and went up to the Marine Guard and told them that I was a new person, a new officer coming to work in the, a section within the embassy. And what was your cover role at the embassy because uh, you, you certainly wouldn't be announced as the, the latest CIA officer. Well, I really can't tell you that. OK, OK, that's uh, that's understood. But uh, I'm presuming the role was just like a regular admin role that gave you a reason to be at the embassy with without obviously signposting that you were working for the CIA. Well, it was a very normal job. Yes. Yeah. And I, yeah. I had the name of the secretary in the office. So she came up to get me and she knew my dual role and took me down to the CIA office. And I say down yeah, because all the offices, the, the ambassador was on the ninth floor, but the other offices were below that on the seventh right. and eighth floor. Yeah. What was your introduction like to your fellow officers in Moscow? Well, I I got through the first door and then the second door into the office, and it was, oh, what a relief I felt. I thought, oh, I, I'm okay. I'm safe now that I'm inside in the safe office with all my friends. And somebody had cooked me, made me chocolate chip cookies, and oh, it was a wonderful celebration because I hadn't seen them since summer. So were you put up in the hotel for just one night and then you were moved to some more permanent accommodation yeah well thank heavens i was only there one night i had checked in with the admin section in the um embassy and i said please could you make sure i i can get transferred to my my permanent apartment at, during the day and she had made that happen and so at the end of the day the driver took me out to my apartment which was um south of the embassy still within moscow but several miles south 
Who else lived in that block? Was it just diplomats or were there other Soviet citizens living there? Well, diplomats, businessmen and journalists. And it was four high-rise buildings. There were no Russians, no Soviet citizens there. There was a guard. It was all gated. It was all fenced in. There was a guard there. He was to keep this, the Soviet citizens from coming in. But, of course, we knew why he prevented that. He didn't want anyone to, you know, any Soviet citizen to penetrate this um, very pure kind of foreign ghetto. We called it the diplomatic ghetto. Yeah, I guess they want to minimize the uh, possibility of you corrupting any uh, Soviet citizens. Of course, and what they actually did was they, the guy, the guard at the gate, he would trigger the surveillance teams who then would follow targets of any any nature who they thought they should follow. You're now in the CIA offices in the Moscow embassy. What do they start you off working on? You have several months ahead of you getting to know your operating area, getting to know the streets, what what patterns you can develop. Um, my first job that first weekend, um, it was the, the weekend of, of the uh, October Revolution, uh, and they had a big parade. I always say they had that for me. But um, so... I went with a neighbor because on the floor that I lived in, in this apartment, there were four apartments and we were all on the, in these four apartments, all American. And there was this nice man at the other end of the hall from me who was an American. And so he invited me to go downtown to watch the parade. Well, um, that's what we did. And when I learned how to look for surveillance, the one thing I always knew, you can never see surveillance if you're on foot because they can totally surround you and you will never see them because you can't get far enough away. You can't drag them far enough away to be able to identify them. Anybody can be a surveillance on the street. So um, I was just basically getting area knowledge by going with him downtown. Um, and then I went out on foot that first weekend, too, on Sunday. And I remember I I walked down the street, got on a trolley, and then went and got into the closest metro station um, and went for a ride and, and really started just expanding my area knowledge. On the way back, uh, as I walked back to my apartment from the trolley, there was a man selling ice cream. And so I had heard that Soviet ice cream was wonderful. So I stopped and I bought a brick of it. And it was about the size of a brick wrapped in foil paper. So I put it into my purse. Now it's very cold out. It's like in the teens. So it wasn't going to melt in there. And I walked home to my apartment. And when I got home, then I got busy unpacking and putting things away and and just puttering around until it dawned on me that I had not taken that ice cream out of my purse. I really expected the, the worst. But it was still mostly frozen. And it was so delicious. It was that soft, melty ice cream. Oh, it was wonderful. Yeah. And in my my um, household goods that I shipped over, um, we all could ship over 2,000 pounds, I had brought a case of Smucker's Butterscotch. Smucker's is a very American brand of sauces for ice cream. And that butterscotch, all I could think of was that butterscotch was going to go great with that vanilla ice cream. So that was what I did the first weekend. Um, the following week, actually, I, I went to the admin officer and told her I wanted to buy a, a car, a Soviet Fiat. Jiggly. And that's exactly what I did. Um, a group of us from the embassy who had just arrived were taken down to a railroad um, station kind of uh, uh, a lot where there were hundreds of these little Soviet fiats, little square cars. And uh, she said, what color do you want? Well, there was orange and there was yellow and there was turquoise. None of them were very Sneaky, you know, you couldn't 
disappear in any of those cars. So I picked an orange one. And with that car, then I was able to expand my ability to go out and see whether the Soviets were following, whether the KGB had identified me or cared about who I was and what I was doing. Now, at this time, the CIA had a secret weapon to detect Soviet surveillance. Can you describe to me the SRR-100? Yes, the SRR-100 was a receiver and it had one crystal in it, one frequency. And that was the frequency that KGB surveillance used to communicate between each other. So if two cars went out, they each had a radio, and they would communicate to each other about what their target was doing. So this was as large as a cigarette package. It was milled uh, metal, sheet metal. At the top, it had an on-off switch. It had a squelched switch. And it also had an an antenna connection plug-in. The antenna was a loop antenna, and it went around our necks. It was covered in plastic, and it went around our necks and plugged into the top of this receiver. Then that neck loop communicated to a Phonak earpiece. Um, It was an induction. It wasn't wireless, but it was early wireless, I guess. And so we would put the neck loop around, plug it into the top of this receiver, turn it on, get the squelch right, and then put that receiver somewhere on our body. It was body worn. So headquarters had made this wonderful um, harness to put the the um, SR-100 in. It had a pocket in it, and it fit the men just beautifully. But I'm going to say I had different equipment, and the harness simply didn't fit my female body. (laughs) So I was stuck with tucking it down the front of my bra. But um, when I would lean over or uh, turn, it would kind of squidgy up. And of course, it was all under your clothing. We didn't want anyone to know that we had this capability. So then In February, right after I arrived in November, we got this brand new invention out in Moscow, and it was a piece of Velcro. It was magic. And so I took the Velcro, piece of Velcro home and made a pouch out of an old t-shirt and and then Velcroed it on the side of my bra so the receiver would stay put and wouldn't wiggle all around. So that worked beautifully. So with this receiver, the men um, would go out and drive around Moscow. They would take their kids to school. They would go to church. They would go to the Bolshoi. They would go hiking or family picnic or skiing. And they would be able to hear whether there was a team, a surveillance team, active on them by what they heard in this earphone this earpiece so then when they would go out they would hear targets turning left targets turning right targets stopped targets home targets lost sometimes that happened um targets at the embassy so they could always hear the active surveillance that was following them it wouldn't help them determine where they were necessarily but they knew they had a surveillance team whose activities, whose actions corresponded to what they were hearing on this um, receiver. So when I went out, I would I would put the receiver on, put the earpiece in, and here I would go <clears throat> away from the embassy and drive away, and this is what I would hear. Absolutely nothing. So then I would turn it on and off, and then I would change the batteries. It had to be operator error, right? Um, But it it never was. They simply didn't think I was a threat. They didn't follow me. The Soviets didn't use women as operations officers. They used them perhaps as bait, but not as serious operations officers who were there 
with evil intent to collect their in secret information. A while back, you uh, mentioned your nickname as uh, Party Marty. Can you let me know what, what you did in your spare time when you were in Moscow? Right. Um, there were a lot of single women in the embassy. They were uh, secretaries. They were officers. They were um, uh, assistants. Um, and I got to know basically all of them, uh, all the single women. And um, they would have wine and cheese parties in their apartments. Many of them lived within the embassy buildings. There were apartments in the embassy buildings. Or I, on a weekend, I would ask three or four of them to come with me and we'd go out and see um, the churches that I had discovered outside of town, which they, most of them didn't have cars. So this was a, a fun activity for them. I also um, would go to the Marine House on Wednesday nights and drink beer and watch movies. The Marines showed movies every Wednesday night. And then Friday night, that was the Marine House open house, and um, all the Westerners would come to the Marine House as well as Americans. Um, we'd drink beer, we'd dance. It was the 70s. It was disco. Um, and so I had a presence, you know. I was observable. I was a normal 30-year-old um, young woman. Um, looking for fun and um, enjoying myself. Um, it was important that I had a presence even within the embassy. Um, part of what what we do, uh, what, what we fight in other embassies around the world is um, the other embassy people suspect who we are, who's, who the CIA officers are. It's a game they call Spot the Spook. So I never wanted to be invisible. I wanted my colleagues to think that I was doing something um, with them. I wasn't separate. I wasn't, and most of them never knew I worked for CIA. They just thought I did some bland job. They they didn't talk about me because I was observable. I was part of the group. And I think, one, it was wonderful for me as a person not to have fun and to be with other people. And also, um, it helped, you know, blend me in to the whole embassy social life. I think I heard an interesting tale where you went out with these women to sightsee and go to various parks in Moscow, and you'd be taking photos of them. <laughs> um, but you weren't necessarily interested in taking photos of them. You were much more interested in the background that was in these photos. Yes, it, it was rather amazing because when when John was in Vietnam, he bought this wonderful Nikon camera, which had a wide angle lens. So I could take all nature pictures with these ladies in in the picture. But I was really taking pictures of dead drop sites. Absolutely. <laughs> they never knew. <laughs> I love that story. It's so good. It's so good. When did you first hear about Trigon? Sorry, we're going to have to uh, end the episode there. So do make sure that you're subscribed so you don't miss out on next week's episode with uh, Marty. It's a corker. Do make sure you visit the episode notes where there's videos, photos and links to Marty's book. Now, this podcast would not exist without our financial supporters. And I want to thank one and all of them for their generous support. If you want to help us, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate for more information. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.
Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.